and the evangelical was Craig Blomberg, a very well-known evangelical New Testament theologian at Denver Seminary. And the Mormon was Stephen Robinson, who uh, taught for many years in, as a theologian at uh, Brigham Young University. They met for a, a couple of years in private, sort of off-the-record dialogue, and decided to write a book together. And it's, a, it's still, I think, an outstanding book uh, in which they took a variety of topics, uh, the nature of God, the nature of revelation, authority, uh, Christ, salvation, uh, various topics like that. And they each wrote on the subject, and then uh, the other one would respond. They would each respond to what each wrote. And uh, then at the end, they actually had a chapter of uh, where are some of the things we find ourselves agreeing on, which was, uh, I think, a very important uh, exercise. And in the uh, very fine journal, of which I'm an editor, Books of Culture, uh, I, uh, I wrote a review of that book, a very favorable review. I saw it as an important breakthrough. And uh, a little while after that, Craig Blomberg called me and thanked me for the, the good review, and the favorable review. And also uh, said that uh, he and Stephen Robinson had been talking about expanding the conversation. But he said, you know, I'm at Denver Seminary. They're not against what I'm doing here, but I don't really have any institutional clout. You're the president at Fuller. Uh, is there some way that you could uh, team up with someone uh, who has a little more authority at Brigham Young? And Bob was the dean of the religion program at uh, Brigham Young at the time, right? And uh, and so uh, we each got some funding for it, uh, evangelical funding on my side, Mormon funding on the other. And uh, we began these discussions. And uh, an amazing thing happened early on, because in the first session that we had at BYU, uh, we, we asked each other, uh, what, should we, what should we read to talk about? And, uh, as evangelicals right away, we said, well, the one book, they, they said, what's the one book that, that we ought to read to sort of understand evangelical theology? And uh, we chose uh, John Stott's Basic Christianity. And, uh, and they chose a book by, by Bob. And uh, the next time we met at Fuller, and uh, we began the day, we said, well, what did you think of the John Stott? So we loved it. Nothing in there that we disagreed with. We would want to say other things, but there was nothing in there that we disagreed with, which kind of amazed us right off that uh, Mormons would say, what a fine book. Uh, and we discovered also that they are very fond of C.S. Lewis. I'll talk a little bit about why C.S. Lewis is a favorite writer at uh, Brigham Young and a uh, very important influence on the kind of views of uh, basic issues of faith at, at Brigham Young. And uh, uh, around that time, I got a little nervous about uh, dragging Fuller Seminary into what I knew would be a controversial thing. And here I was the president getting the seminary into trouble. Uh, usually, you know, presidents worry about faculty members. But uh, a faculty member told me he was at some uh, liberal gathering. And somebody said, you seem like such a nice guy. How do you survive at Fuller? And, he said, well, our president gets into more theological trouble than anybody else on the back of the But uh, uh, we, uh, I, I brought Bob to our board of trustees. And uh, we had a cl closed door session. And he, made a, he said a number of things that uh, won them over to the idea of having this dialogue. But I think the most compelling point he made was this. He said, we Mormons have been out of contact, out of discussion with historic Christianity for 150 years, we're not even sure we use the right language to explain our view. And uh, we need to be talking to people here at Fuller uh, in a safe place where we can try out formulations. When we say we deny the Trinity, what does that mean? Uh, are we communicating it properly? Uh, when we talk about the relationship of grace and works, when we talk about deification, uh, and uh, we just need help. And, uh, you know, how does this sound to you? Uh, is this a good way to put uh, something that we disagree with you on? And uh, that has really been the point of our discussions, is uh, not so much to try to turn Mormons into evangelicals or evangelicals into Mormons, but to uh, really be exploring uh, 
some of the more controversial doctrines of Mormonism and some of the doctrines that we evangelicals consider to be essential to who we are. And, uh, and yet, we're often unpopular for, for those kinds of things as well. And it's been a wonderful time. Uh, over the years, we have uh, looked at the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, we've looked at the nature of God. Uh, we've looked at uh, what salvation is. We've looked at uh, our fallenness, the question of human beings in their fallen state. Uh, we've talked about deification. And uh, it's been an amazing time together because uh, uh, I certainly, and I think all of us on the evangelical side, uh, have discovered that uh, not everything that we thought Mormons believed uh, are things that Mormons believe. Uh, we still disagree about some serious issues, but not as many disagreements as we thought we had at the outset. All of this was uh, off the record, closed door. Uh, we, we actually were very impressed by the fact that the Mormons argued with each other. Uh, as one, one of our, our Mormon participants died uh, during this process, uh, Paul Peterson, who was just a terrific guy. And there were times when he would say to Bob Mellon, uh, you know, I'm not as sure of that as you are. Uh, I think they're making a good point. You know? And uh, there were good discussions among us. And so the idea that these two guys show up on bicycles and knock on the door and have this uh, sort of ideological sort of line, uh, we discovered a very different kind of, of, of Mormonism. And uh, those of us have, as evangelicals, you know, I can still remember back in the 70s, I was at Calvin College, and uh, I was called by a, a dean of a major university in the East, an Ivy League school. They were going to have a, a symposium on campus on religion in America. And he said, you know, we've never had a, an evangelical voice, um, and we'd like to include it now. I think we've got to take you people more seriously than we have in the past. Uh, would you come and be a part of this? And I, 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 I really couldn't do it. It was a, a, a scheduled conflict that just couldn't make it. And, and, and what I remember, the exact words, he said to me, are there any other smart ones? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, I, I think that we've seen a Mormon scholarship emerge, and yet there are still people who would say, are there any other smart ones? You know, maybe even, are there any smart ones? Uh, you know, you'll, you'll, if you don't know Bob. Yeah, yeah, you don't know Bob. You would. And, uh, and so there's this, uh, you know, as evangelicals, I think we can understand the, 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 the importance of the emergence of a, of a scholarly, uh, community within the larger community, uh, sometimes in a little bit of tension with our own fellow uh, Christians in our movement, and uh, and yet the importance of, uh, of really clarifying uh, who we are and, and what we believe. So we've had some uh, some excellent times together, uh, and any of those topics or any related topics, uh, we're happy to talk about as candidly as, as we can today. Uh, but one of the public breakthroughs, we did all of this off the record, a lot of behind closed doors. Uh, I can still remember at one point we raised a, a question that was a very challenging question for our LDS friends. And uh, took a break and the Mormons went off and talked among themselves. And Bob came back and said, you know, we, we just said, do we, do we dare talk about this? And can we just close the door and, and really struggle, you know, share with you our own struggles on this particular issue? And it was a wonderful time where we built trust, candor, but it was all off the record. And then uh, Bob called me, it was a 60, uh, uh, 90, no, it was 2004, the, the Mormon Tabernacle event. Bob called me and he said, uh, and, and Bob has been all over the evangelical world. I mean, he uh, I once had a very hard time getting a hold of you, and I had to talk to you, and you, know, you kept not answering. And finally, after two days, you answered the phone, and I said, you've been hard to get along. He said, yeah, well, I'm at Wheaton at the Billy Graham Center, where I mean, <laughs> a, a discussion of the Trinity, and I, I said, you know, this. But uh, uh, he called me and said, you know, at the University of Utah, uh, the university is going to have Robbie Zacharias. Many of you know who Robbie 
Zacharias is a very prominent woman, uh, a very prominent evangelical uh, apologist and a very compelling speaker. And uh, they're going to have, and I'm thinking about inviting him to Brigham Young. But he said a lot of people at BYU want to know who Robbie Zacharias is. And by now they know a little bit about uh, you and Fuller Seminary. If I can get him to come, would you come that night and introduce him? And I said, I thought he'd be glad to. And, uh, and then uh, called me a week later and said, you know, I just cleared this with the people in Salt Lake City, the church officials, church leaders. And they said, why don't we, why don't we sponsor him? And to make a long story short, they decided to have it at the Mormon Tabernacle. And uh, it was uh, built, we built it as an evening of friendship between evangelicals and Mormons. And Robbie's topic was a signed topic by the Mormon leadership is, what is the gospel? And the only restriction was no Mormon bashing, just a positive one hour presentation about what the gospel is. And uh, standing room only that night, evangelicals and LDS. And I opened the evening with, uh, uh, you know, there hadn't been uh, non-Mormons at the podium speaking there since uh, Dwight L. Moody, a hundred years earlier, had been invited by Brigham Young because Dwight L. Moody stopped off in Salt Lake City on the way to California and uh, was asked to give a lecture. So it was kind of a historic event. And I, I had seven minutes, Robbie had an hour. And in my seven minutes, I, I said, uh, this is you know, a wonderful evening of friendship. This is a new stage. We often shout at each other, we said mean things about each other, but tonight we come together as friends who want to talk about the gospel and what the gospel is. Then I said this, I said, uh, you know, as an evangelical, I want to apologize to my Mormon friends that uh, we have borne false witness. We've sinned against you. We've, we've, we've been bearing false witness because we've often told you what you believe rather than ask you what you believe. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm sorry. Well. And Robbie did a terrific job that night. But the next morning, the, the headlines in the wire service was Fuller Sem uh, Evangelical Seminary President Apologizes to Mormons. <laughs> I've got to say, the hate mail still comes. <laughs> Who are you to apologize? You know, you don't speak for all evangelicals. And, you know, the, of course, the parallel would be, I could, if I were an African-American church, I'd say, I want to apologize. We, we, we white evangelicals have often been guilty of racism. And I want to be meaning to speak on behalf of every evangelical. Um, and it just seems clear to me that uh, we have often distorted and uh, demonized uh, Mormons. And uh, so I've never backed down uh, from that. But it was my, uh, my little bit of sharing and suffering for the cause. <laughs> but uh, uh, Robbie, Robbie did a wonderful job that night. And, I, and he himself has never regretted uh, what he did. Uh, he saw it as a kind of breakthrough for his own sense of relationships. Uh, we were with the head of the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God last week. And he had just spent uh, two days with uh, Elder Jeffrey Holland, of one of the 12 apostles of the Mormon Church. And uh, so they had a wonderful time together uh, talking about their spiritual pilgrimages, and their relationship with Christ, and uh, uh, had a very positive experience. So there, there, there are some good things happening, and uh, we can get into some of the substance of this, but I just wanted to give the, the background. How many times have we met now? Uh, 23. 23 dialogues, some of them a couple days at a time. We, uh, uh, we've been meeting, alternating between Brigham Young University at Fuller Seminary. But uh, one year, I said to Bob, uh, I think we ought to visit some of the Mormon sites. So we went to Nauvoo, Illinois, uh, where the Mormon uh, community was uh, when Joseph Smith was murdered in the nearby uh, Carthage jail. Uh, we went to the Carthage jail cell together and sat there. And uh, we had wonderful lectures on the banks of the Mississippi, the place where the Mormons, uh, when they fled Nauvoo, crossed the river. Uh, there were a lot of good things that happened there. And uh, uh, the next time, uh, two years later, uh, we were talking about meeting, and I said, I think we ought to go to Palmyra, New York. So we went to Palmyra, uh, to the place where uh, Joseph uh, uh, 
brought forth, as Mormon said, brought forth the Book of Mormon. I like that phrase. We don't have to commit ourselves on it. And uh, we went to uh, a number of Mormon sites, the Sacred Grove. We sat in the Sacred Grove together, discussed uh, the important issues. And then Bob said to me, uh, you know, we've been to two Mormon sacred places. We've got to go to an evangelical place. And I said, well, unless you go to Geneva, Switzerland, I don't want to go any place. Uh, we don't really have any sacred places. And he said, well, can we go to Wheaton? <laughs> 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 we met at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton. And, uh, went to the Pacific Art Mission, went to Moody Bible Institute, and ended up one evening at uh, Willow Creek Church. And uh, these were all at the request of our LDS friends. So we've had some good times together, and uh, the conversation continues. And I want to say we just had a great time at Kelp. Uh, good spirit. Uh, my sense was that a lot of people on the grassroots level are working together with Mormons, evangelicals working together, uh, committed to some common causes, uh, sometimes in our marriage issues. And uh, people are eager to uh, seek common ground, even while recognizing that there are very important theological issues that divide us. But not everything that we thought divided us really does divide us. And so we're, we're exploring things. And with that, I, I want to turn over to uh, uh, Bob Millett. Bob is uh, uh, professor of what they call ancient scripture, although some of us don't believe that they're all that ancient, uh, some of them, but uh, no, he's uh, uh, written a lot of books. In fact, uh, one book I, I would really recommend his excellent Erdman's book, where there's a really fine forward and afterward by me. <laughs> uh, but he's written some other books too, and you might want to ask him about some of these things. Uh, an excellent book called Whatever Happened to the Cross in Mormonism? And uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about some of these things. So, yeah. Bob Mellon, thanks. Okay. For, yeah. Well, nice to be with you. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, what a delight. Um, I've not been here. The last time, Jan, I was with you, you were in that other smaller place, right? <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, I thought uh, I thought I'd share with you a couple of the three experiences that have been really meaningful during the last uh, 13 years. And just after the book uh, that Erdman's published, uh, A Different Jesus Question, uh, I was asked about a few months later to come to what was then known as the Salt Lake Theological Seminary. They don't uh, exist anymore, but they it was an evangelical seminary in Salt Lake that had been there several years, and they wanted me to discuss the book and respond to questions. And uh, I, I spent a couple of hours with them, and questions were challenging and tough, and uh, a little bit good. And uh, finally, at the very end, one uh, one of their number said, "Bob, here's the final question." I said, "Okay." He said, "What can we do for you?" I said, what? He said, what can we evangelicals do for our Mormon friends? I said, I don't think I've ever been asked that before. <laughs> he said, now what can we do for you? And I thought it was a, a wonderful question. I said, well, cut us a little slack and give us a little time. He said, say more. And I said, you know, uh, similar to what Mitch said, uh, you've been at this religion-making business for 2,000 years. We've been at it for 170. We're just now trying to feel our way toward understanding our own faith, much less that of others. And uh, so be a little patient with us if we don't always come forward with an answer that is completely intelligible. Um, be a little patient. We're working at it. And as Rich suggested, the development of, a, of an academic uh, community is not a, uh, a speedy process, but, it, but it's coming. 
among the more interesting things we did during those years, in 2005, well, in fact, what happened? In the year 2004, I had heard about a, a conference that was being held, an academic conference held at the Library of Congress in D.C. Uh, on Jonathan Winters. Jonathan Winters. <laughs> Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> Jonathan, that would have been a good conference too. I like Jonathan uh, Jonathan uh, Winters. Compare the two, even. Yeah. <laughs> On Jonathan Edwards, and it caused me to, to think. Hmm. And uh, I was asked to serve on a church-wide uh, committee to discuss how to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Joseph Smith's birth. That would be in 2005. And, I, and in the first meeting, I said to the man in charge, who was one of the Mormon apostles, I said, why don't we have it at the Library of Congress? He said, and he laughed and said, yeah, sure. I said, no, why don't we have it at the Library of Congress? Well, what would be, I said, well, let me tell you what I've seen recently. We made one phone call, really, and the response was, of course, that would be a wonderful thing to do. And so in 2005, um, we held a, con a conference uh, at the Library of Congress, uh, Richard spoke, of course. Uh, Randy Balmer, who was then at uh, uh, Barnard College in, uh, in Columbia, and now at uh, Dartmouth. But uh, he spoke. Uh, Jerry McDermott, who's, who's at, uh, um, where else in Virginia? Yeah. Starts with an R, yeah. not, not Richmond. Roanoke. Roanoke College. Uh, Jerry spoke. Anyway, we had we had a, a large number of uh, Latter-day Saint speakers, but we had a large number of, of uh, Roman Catholic and LDS. Um, one of our one of our friends who was at the Durham University in England uh, spoke, and so forth. It was a it was a very interesting occasion, and uh, and I think I think uh, those settings have proven to be extremely helpful in bringing before uh, the public the kind of conversations we've been having. We were, uh, Richard, I don't remember where we were, whether it was Philadelphia, or it was, it was a meeting of the American Academy of Religion, whether it was Philadelphia or Atlanta, but uh, we asked Richard Bushman, uh, LDS historian at Columbia, to come and discuss his upcoming book on the biography of Joseph Smith. And I remember very well, uh, you will too, Rich Bushman beginning the meeting, his opening lines, he turned to our, to our group, half of which were evangelical, and said, is Joseph Smith an impossibility for you? There's just silence. He said, no, I asked, is this an impossibility for you? It was a rather probing question. And someone said, well, no, not, not an impossibility. Well, it was enough of a, it was enough of stimulation that took place there. Rich decided at our next meeting to give a presentation on the possibility of a Joseph Smith and asked some very hard questions. Uh, one of which I thought was fascinating was, uh, uh, I think you told the story of Cotton Mather reporting his vision of an angel. It sounded very much like Joseph Smith. It sounded very much like Moroni. Was my bed. And this person. And, and so it, it presents, uh, it presented these kinds of, of similarities, and so how impossible might it be? Or you were asking a more pertinent question, which is, is there an alternative than he's either a liar or a lunatic? So we've had some, some uh, challenging and some wonderful conversations through the years. I, I think I ought to say something about Ravi Zacharias, to his credit. In the November, Rich mentioned the meeting was held in November, but prior to that, there was a lot of preparation. I, uh, myself and a Baptist pastor friend, who's a good friend of Ravi, flew out to Atlanta to meet with Ravi, and I knew that one of the things I had to say to him was, can I just ask you not to bash us while you're there? But I was very nervous about doing that. We get there, we have a good conversation. Ravi talks about how excited he is to be coming. And before I could open my mouth, he said, Now, Bob, I want you to know something. What's that? He said, I want you to know 
that I consider this to be one of the most significant invitations I've ever received. And I would never do anything to dishonor that invitation. You're safe with me. And I thought it was a, uh, not only a gentlemanly thing to do, but frankly a Christian thing to do. And, uh, and it was a great evening, and, uh, and uh, it showed what rich is made out of, uh, having to deal with all those nasty emails. Um, anyway, um, there's a, I received a, a letter just the other day from a, a Mormon official, one of our senior officers of the church, who simply said, appreciate all you've been doing, thanks for this, thanks for that, uh, keep it up. Uh, one more question, where's this going? He said, let me say that another way. If we're not going to change our doctrine and they're not going to change their doctrine, where is this going? He really was, as you can tell, asking a question in terms of, is this in any fashion, a la 1960s, a kind of ecumenical movement that will dilute or water down fundamentals of each of our faiths? And it was a good, it was a good question. Uh, I spent days just thinking about how to answer it. But what came to me was this, and that is, we have just begun. <coughs> Rich mentioned some of the topics, atonement, well, fall, atonement, grace works, uh, the trinity, deification, authority, Joseph Smith's first vision, uh, scripture. But as I began to reflect on it, it occurred to me there were at least 12 other topics we just had to get to eventually. Uh, not the least of which we talked about how important it would be to have a, a, a gathering in which we did nothing but talk about the hymns of the faith. When I was doing the work on the book, uh, Whatever Happened to the Cross, I wanted to go back. As some of you may know, you already know, I'm sure, there are no crosses on Mormon churches. Does that mean Mormons are opposed to the cross? Of course not. If we are, we're opposed to the New Testament. Uh, the preaching of the cross was, was Paul's assignment. Uh, and so I began, I went back and did some historical study on this to find out what I could about crosses. And both in terms of on buildings and crosses in church literature or crosses in sermons. And what I found was rather surprising. Uh, I found this isn't very dramatic uh, of an answer, but one of the reasons, if not the principal reason, why there were never crosses on Mormon churches is simple. Mormonism, many of the people of the early church, came, had come out of a Puritan tradition. Puritanism was anti-ceremonial. Not just the robes, but the buildings. There weren't crosses on Baptist churches until the 1830s. And so it isn't we were ever opposed to it. I mean, one of the things I was searching for was some statement from a church leader saying, whatever you do, I'm going to put a cross on the church never came up. Uh, it was just something we, we just had never done. The other thing I did, though, was go back and search historically sermons from the beginning from church leaders to see if I could find anything. And what I found was they spoke of the cross all the time. Christ died for our sins on the cross. I went for that matter, I went back and researched the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants looking for cross. It was everywhere. Well, maybe the more interesting thing I did was to go to our hymn book and read every, every hymn that had to do with the atoning mission of Christ. And it's a fascinating study because what you come up with is, is it is talked about consistently. Now, something, if you're not aware, Latter-day Saints believe that Jesus' suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane was not just preparatory not just awful anticipation of what he would face the next day, but that what took place in Gethsemane had redemptive power, that, that it was part of the redemp a, a redemptive part of the passion. He begins the suffering in Gethsemane. But what we would believe is that it's climaxed, finished, completed on the cross. But you know, you tend to teach to your distinctives. And for the longest time, whenever Mormons talked about the atonement, they would say, you'd hear them say it, boy, Jesus suffering in Gethsemane is hard to conceive. He did that for me. And and uh, it was just 
part of the conversation. It isn't that they didn't believe he suffered on the cross. It's just our distinctive happened to be Gethsemane. And so it became, became fascinating to put together the fact that these are things that have just been there all along, and I found them everywhere uh, in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. So it's, it's, it's part of the, of the belief structure of the church. But because people tend to emphasize what they're different in, we had over the years emphasized, instead of cross, Gethsemane. Well, it's, it, it, it has been, and, it, and, it, and I'm sure it's going to be, a, uh, a remarkable future. Uh, one of the questions I've asked quite a bit is this, and I've been approached, as Rich knows, we've been approached by a representative of the Roman Catholic Church and asked, do you plan to do the same thing with Roman Catholics? And I've always said, you know, uh, it sounds terrific. Uh, I can't imagine where the energy would come from. But there's another, there's another more interesting challenge, a different dynamic, and that is what we have in working with evangelicals is you don't have an organizational structure, right? With Roman Catholics, you do have an organizational structure. Thus, what we've been operating is an academic dialogue, not an ecclesiastical dialogue, an academic dialogue. And so that when you, when you begin dealing with Roman Catholics, you, you, you begin to think, well, who's going to be brought in? And if someone says, well, we'll bring a cardinal. And my reply is, let's see, Cardinal is about the level of Apostle. Uh, maybe they should be coming. And, and so it's, it's a different dynamic. And so for now, we're perfectly safe and, and comfortable doing, doing our work with evangelicals. But uh, yes, there's much interest. I've been told by many people, you really ought to spend more time dialoguing with, with uh, Eastern Orthodox. Because they have a surprising number of things in common with us in terms of beliefs. Um, well, I'm done. Should we ask what questions they have? But just let, let me make one point uh, about the Gethsemane thing. Uh, this, this is something, you know, Bob, had, Bob said earlier, Kelvin, that one of the things that has meant so much to him was that in the dialogue, you learn a lot more about your own perspective. You know, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, some of you here need to hear this. Uh, out of her catechism, when it asks the question going through the Apostles' Creed, what comfort is it to you that he suffered? And it says that throughout his whole life, and especially at the end, he suffered for my redemption. And for us, uh, if he only showed up for three hours on a cross, that wouldn't have done. Uh, it was the, the baby in the manger. It was going through the, as, as the African-American slave songs have it, which are in many ways more profound theologically than some of our own theology. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. Uh, the fact that he had to, as the book of Hebrews says, that uh, he suffered in all the ways that we've suffered, and yet without sin. And so Gethsemane is a part of the redemptive passion and suffering of Christ. And, uh, and, so, and it was only in uh, thinking I had to respond to Mormonism on that that I realized that they were emphasizing something that we had de-emphasized. And I think also they had de-emphasized something that they should have been emphasizing. And I, I commend to you uh, Elder Jeffrey Holland, who's one of the 12 apostles, and just a very strong supporter of what we're doing. And, and, that isn't true of all of the church hierarchy. Uh, they they support it in different with different degrees of enthusiasm. But our champion is Elder Jeffrey Allen. He's just a wonderful guy. And uh, he did a talk a couple years ago uh, to all the Mormons in the world. I mean, 14 million Mormons. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, general conference. Yeah, general conference, and it gets streamed to people in Australia and all over the place. And uh, his talk, it's on YouTube, and it's called No One Was With Him. No One Was With Him. Uh, Christ's Suffering on the Cross, which I've played at, in classes at Fuller Seminary. And 
and my students have said if they did not know it was a Mormon, they would have thought it was somebody from the Billy Graham Association. I mean, it's just, and so, uh, so often people will say, well, they're just telling you that stuff. They, they want you to think better of them, but that's not what they really think. And one of the things that's very important in this kind of dialogue is what do they say to each other? And, uh, and so to pay attention, not just to what they're saying to us, but what the leadership of the church is saying uh, to their own constituents. And uh, we are seeing, uh, I said this at Calvin, let me just say it quickly here. On the evangelical side, uh, we have sort of uh, discerned three different strands within contemporary Mormonism. Uh, what we call folk Mormonism. Uh, my Mormon friends make jokes about Mormon. They'll say, oh, well, he goes planetary a lot. And uh, that idea that every Mormon man is with his family going to live on a planet and, and uh, be a god and all of that, uh, that's not canonical. That's not uh, official teaching. And so it's so important to distinguish between folk Mormonism and uh, the official teachings, uh, the canonical teachings. So there's the folk Mormonism, what God now is, man once was, or what man now is, God once was, what God now is, man may become. As, it's never found in Mormon scripture any place. It's a, a kind of folk thing that uh, has been taken on, but it isn't, uh, doesn't have official status. And secondly, there's temple Mormonism and the rites of Mormonism that uh, are embedded in temple practices and the like. And then, but thirdly, there's what we call redemptive Mormonism. Redemptive Mormonism, and it's there. If you read the Book of Mormon without worrying about whether it's a revelation from God or, or whether it's true history or anything like that, whether it really were golden plates, uh, the theology of the Book of Mormon over and over again emphasizes that we're fallen creatures and we're desperately in need of salvation, that we can't earn our own salvation, and that it's only through the atoning work of Christ on the cross, completed on the cross, that we can, we can be saved. And uh, that's there. And what we've seen in the last couple of decades is a move from those things sometimes not being articulated, and they have moved to the center of things. And so more and more, there's a very strong emphasis on Jesus Christ and on the atoning work of Christ and the need for salvation, and much more emphasis on the Christian the scriptures, uh, I mean, on the New Testament. Uh, when I first met Bob, one of the most impressive things he said to me was, you know, I believe all that stuff in Mormonism, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I live by the epistle to the Romans. And uh, uh, I'm seeing more and more of that in my, my Mormon friends. So. But anyway, questions, anybody, for either of us or both of us? Yeah. Sure. Um, in light of the statement that you just made, um, about like the Lorenzo Snow couple of the idea of Mormons that had no planet. Would you consider the LDS teaching manuals? Yeah. Would you consider those official yeah. representative? Well, it or is in a way. Teaching manuals be folklore. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. And I've I've been hammered on that one quite a bit by people who have been critical of the of the dialogue and some of the things I've said because I I've, I've said publicly that the Lorenzo Snow couplet, what God now is man what man now is God once was. Uh, that that's not, that's not canonical teaching. But uh, every year, the, the uh, LDS uh, publishes uh, the writings of a specific past president. And this year, it's Lorenzo Snow. Right. In chapter five, uh, they quote the Lorenzo Snow couplet. And, and refer so, to it as divine revelation. Pardon? And they refer to it as divine revelation. But if you look at the, at the questions for discussion at the end of the chapter, the questions are, uh, how to become more Christ-like. And what, what Gordon Hinckley, the late president of the LDS, said to Time Magazine when they asked him about that, he said, yeah, we used to hear a lot about that. I can't say that I understand what it, what it is. And we certainly don't hear much about that anymore. I'm going to let Bob respond to this because he has a lot more to say about it. Okay. But it's... Uh, it, it, it has been republished recently as a part of a study guide, and frankly, either they would skip Lorenzo Snow altogether, or they would certainly have to mention that, that, that that's something that he taught. But 
the real question is, does it have a function today? And indeed, in the questions for discussion uh, for LDS people, uh, it's treated more as a topic about how to become more Christ-like. Okay. And in fact, our, our, our LDS friends have said to us, if you get a better, a better sense of what that would mean today if you said what man now is, Christ once was. And what Christ now is, man may become. Uh, but I'm going to let Bob pick it up there and, yeah. and uh, deceive them into you bet. being that. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, what you need to tease apart here, when Gordon Hinckley said what he said, which is, uh, I don't know a great deal about this and I don't know anyone else who did, who does. What he was talking about specifically was the first part of that. God was once a man. Clearly, the teaching that man may become as God is a part of the faith. We believe in deification. That's in our, that's in our scriptures. And that's 1 John. Yeah. In the 1 John. Yeah. And so... Uh, Wait, are you saying in, in 1 John it talks about man becoming God? It does no, not it yet says, appear says, what we shall be, but when he shall appear we shall be like him. That's the way... That, that's that's a, the way it's being taught. Yeah. See, there are two verses. One of the Psalms, and then Jesus quotes the Psalm, you are God's. So, I mean, they've, they've got it nailed there that it actually says the words in the Bible that we're gods. But the but question it says is. You will die like men. So, I think we we're, think we're talking about two different categories of people. He says, it said you are like gods, but it says you will die like men. Yeah. So, I don't think we can. Well, let, anyway, let me, I'll let you continue. Let me, so. let me, let me yeah. finish no, this. this. Yeah. What you need to do is tease apart those two ideas. That's two different ideas. God was once a man, man can become like God. God was once a man, I think I could say with Gordon Hinckley, I don't know, I don't know a great deal about that. And when he said, I never hear that talked about much anymore, he's right. Now. Okay, are you familiar with what the church's official response to his statement in Time Magazine was? No. Because our organization, Institute for Religious Research, wrote to the church, mm -hmm. and we asked them about that because it kind of took us by surprise. Right. We got a letter back from, from the church, from the public relations department, saying Hinckley was quoted out of context. So his saying he didn't know much about it was put it out of context. Well, I, I talked to several of the apostles, and in fact, Jeffrey Holland said, I, went, I, w I was with Elder Holland not long after I heard that. And I said, what's he talking about? And he said, well, I went to him and asked him, President, what do you mean? Brother Hinckley said, you know, this has created a big firestorm. All I meant was I can't picture God ever been a crotchety old man like me. <laughs> Well, that's part of it. The other, the other thing is, it's, it's a press interview. How much can you say in a press when you have to speak in? What's the word we use? Soundbite. 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 Now, my experience has been, as I talk with evangelical groups or people of other faiths, if you can give me five minutes, I can at least make them a little more comfortable with our concept of deification. It is and that it is a biblical concept. It's hard to imagine how be therefore perfect plus becoming joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, plus we shall see him as he is, we shall be like him, plus become partakers of the divine nature isn't talking about something to do with men and women acquiring through the powers of Christ's atonement, through the powers of the Holy Spirit, divine qualities, divine attributes. And so when you ask church leaders today what we mean by that, they'll say, becoming more Christ-like. Is there a difference between divine qualities and becoming God? If becoming I were God with yeah. God's powers. There is, and I think, I think what I would say is this. The distinction that's made by, by uh, Eastern Orthodox would be we acquire the energies but not the essence of God. That would be a distinction I'd feel very comfortable with. We've so, had a we've had a, a three-year dialogue with the uh, uh, Watchman Nee people on the same issue, and they finally clarified it by saying the same thing that uh, we participate in the divine energies and the Eastern Orthodox ideas, the emanating divine energies. What Wesley meant, change from glory into glory. You know, it's it's people have been arguing that Calvin now you can find a doctrine of deification in Calvin as well as Luther and Luther because it, what, what we mean by glorification is we shall be like him it doth not yet appear what we shall be but 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 there's only, uh, 
no human being now who's on the way to becoming Christ-like will ever be worthy of worship. Yeah, I think, I think the way I've said it in some of the things I've written is this. There is nothing authoritative in any LDS writing that suggests that people will ever worship anybody other than the members of the God. Right, We've got a few hands up, so let me point you out first here. So I see one here, two, three. In your 23 meetings that you've had, the topic of social ethics, justice, uh, has that, uh, say a few words about that in terms of uh, maybe the church's ministry to, uh, and with the prisoners or whatever, in terms of what we haven't, we haven't, there we the haven't talked a great deal about either uh, uh, moral values, family values, etc., which we would all share. Uh, nor have we talked about social justice, no. Uh, not that we don't want to, it's just it's on the list of things to do down the road. Right, we've talked race, yeah. right? We've talked racial justice. That's right. Yeah, that's good. Uh, in the blue. Grateful to both of you for being here. Uh, curious to hear your thoughts on how significant the difference between evangelical and Mormon understanding of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah, from an LDS perspective, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He is God the Son. Okay, both. Uh, the title page of the Book of Mormon, He is called the Eternal God. Um, I'm aware that that is a that that is in tension with a teaching of the Latter Day Saints, also that uh, that Jesus Christ is the firstborn spirit Son of God. That's the kind of attention that we kind of wrestle with, which is, how can it be both? Well, uh, when, when we're talking Trinity, we'll, we'll, we'll push our evangelical friends, well then, how about this? And they'll explain, we'll say, well, how about this? And, and one of them will inevitably say, look, it's a mystery. Some things that are just mystery, and by mystery, I mean not, I'm not hiding it, I just don't understand it. But there's no question that at least in the Book of Mormon, Christ is the eternal God. And worthy of worship. And worthy of worship, of course. That, and that there is no distinction between the divinity of the Father and the divinity of the Son. They are of the same divinity. That makes sense? No, that's fine. Okay, I'll break the trumpet. Yeah. I've got a couple questions, really. The distinction hasn't been really brought out that Mormonism also teaches, or the Book of Mormon also teaches that God was eternally God, and that He is spirit, is a spirit being, and also teaches that salvation is by grace after all that we can do. Okay, you got two questions. Okay, so, so we can talk about what the Book of Mormon says, but in the 14 years after Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, Mormonism changed completely. So in is one of his last discourses, he says, we've imagined that God was the God from all eternity, and I'm going to take away the day one and talk, tell you that that isn't true. He was once a man as you are, and, and you've got to learn to be God yourself. Yeah. And so we can quote the Book of Mormon all we want, but the Book of Mormon doesn't teach Mormonism. Well, of course it does. Well, it teaches fundamental redemptive Mormonism. Not the way the Mormons that, that I talk to believe today. If you ask them, is God spirit, they'd say no, he's a man. The God that's Just talked about, the God, no, he hasn't. the God of the Book of Mormon, the center stage God of the Book of Mormon, is Christ. But then, then but you don't pray to Christ. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> well, sorry. Well, the God of the Book of Mormon that is coming to earth when you read, uh, God will come down among his people and redeem them from their sins. That's the coming God of Jesus Christ, okay? God the Father is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, but center stage is Christ. And so he was a spirit. The spirit, when you say he is spirit, you're not talking about God the Father, you're talking about Christ. And every place you want to try to find that, I'll show you. It's a discussion of the redemption of Jesus. But I quoted the Book of Mormon earlier that the God the Father is the unchangeable God from all eternity. Right? There, there is a, you know, we in the certainly in our Reformed tradition we place a great emphasis on the omni attributes of God. God is omnipotent. 
God is omniscient, God is omnipresent. Right. And uh, uh, Mormonism does have a hard time with that, but functionally, uh, when, when you're praying to God, you're, you, you are, God the Father does have uh, something like those attributes, right? No, it's, it's a good example of where there aren't many Latter-day Saints you're going to come across who believe God is still learning something, or God is deficient in his charity, or that God doesn't possess every godly attribute in perfection. So, uh, Book of Mormon language, God knows all things, uh, and there's nothing save he knows it. Uh, but that's true in the Doctrine and Covenants as well, and you, you read it today at, uh, at Calvin. You, you, you yeah, right here. Yeah, they, yeah. The, the other thing that is not clear to me from your discussion here is we make a distinction of salvation, and you have the word for salvation, but you also have the word exaltation. Yeah, yeah you want to distinguish? There's a huge difference between the two. Yeah. Would you please explain to me how, what exaltation is? I will. To its furthest extent, to the third degree of the highest heaven yep. of the three heavens. Yep. The third degree of the highest heavens, and how you get there, and how the temple is, and what that has to do with your temple. Yeah. What you find if you go through LDS scripture, and I'll say that, we'll, we'll confine that to Book of Mormon Doctrine and Covenants, is that salvation, eternal life, uh, are words that are used interchangeably. Okay? The word exaltation is generally referring to the family. And so you'll have a, a Mormon apostle like Russell Nelson speak only two conferences ago and say, salvation is an individual affair, exaltation is a family affair. That is, an individual is responsible under Christ to, to be saved, to accept him and abide by him, abide with him. But exaltation, which is where the temple comes in, that is, that is for us the, the highest of salvation. Can you meet God without being exalted and going through the temple? Would you dwell with God the Father through eternity if you didn't go through the temple and, and meet all the qualifications for exaltation? Yes, you could. You certainly could. But do I, want, do I want a person to go through all of those things? Of course. I believe in the temple. The temple is our place of sacrament, our place of ordinance, and we take we take the temple very seriously. And uh, we would say yes, a person in order to go to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom needs to receive all of the blessings, all of the ordinances. And what benefits does that person have? That's where God comes in. No, no, it's not. It's been taught in the yeah. old gospel principles, mainly. No. Your own book, it says that is where you become a deity. When you become a That is correct. I, I'll quote it to you. Okay, well, what's, okay what's the issue here? Because the whole issue of, of it's been muddied up of, of can a person be worshipped, can a person achieve full godhood, have his own planet, procreate his own plate, his own people, Organize his own the matter to create his own worlds. That is where exaltation comes in and gives you those privileges. And that has been muddied up here tremendously. Okay, what would you like to unmuddy? I'd like to have you tell us exactly. Is is I, I just I think let's take a break. What? Okay, deep breath. Yeah, don't be so so I, tense I, about this. And let's finish that question and move on. You are category, categorically, categorically denying that Mormons have not taught in their doctrine and don't teach today that they can become gods and, they can, and that process comes through exaltation in the temple. I am not denying that. I've you admitted are not that. denying that. No, I am not. That has been fogged up here tremendously to me. No, what, I, what I'm denying is, is that it means anything other than becoming more and more and more like Christ. It doesn't mean that you can organize your own planets and procreate your own children. Go to the church website. Look up the Q&A. And that question is I asked. I know. 
I know it says Let's that. Let's move on to the next part. I know it says that. It's where the church so, is today. If you want to, you can talk about the church of 1830, or you can talk about the church of 19, 2013. Where the church is today is what's on the church website. Yep. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of the switch going over to Kirk for a moment. Yeah. Um, the community of Christ seems to be kind of a sort of in between in that it certainly has roots with Joseph Smith. Right. It has maybe more in common theologically with the evangelical world, including, I think, a full belief in the Trinity. How would they fit into dialogue? And the other group that comes out of service, when I read the description of the dedication of the, of the temple, having a Pentecostal background, among other things, yeah. it surely sounded like a good old Holy Ghost, Holy Roman yeah. revival. And you mentioned that Devin Collin was talking with somebody from the assembly about where would the, I'm wondering that issue of prophecy, of gifts, all those things sure. that are part and parcel of Pentecostalism strike me as being bridges that Mormons and evangelicals can talk about. Okay, your first question had to do with uh, reorganize the community of Christ. Yeah, the break takes place in 1860 with the community of Christ because of a group of people who felt that uh, leadership should reside with the Smith family. They established their headquarters in Lamoni, Iowa, and then later in Independence, Missouri. Um, yeah, we have we have many good friends in the uh, community of Christ, as they're called now. Um, they have, for the most part, however, moved left quite dramatically uh, theologically, in the sense of uh, I would say that what you'd find among the leadership would be a theology comparable to a United Methodist theology. Okay, can I sp speak on that? Yeah. Uh, we had a little encounter with them in uh, Nauvoo. Uh, you know, I, I said this at Calvin earlier, but uh, a wonderful book, interesting book by uh, by uh, uh, White, uh, Kendall White, Kendall. Uh, entitled Mormon Neo-Orthodoxy. And I kind of botched this when I was speaking at Calvin. But he says, and he's a, he's a traditional Mormon who worries about trends in contemporary Mormonism. And he said, uh, Mormonism at its origins had some things in common with the emerging Protestant liberalism of the day. And that is three things. Uh, a belief in a finite God, a belief in a self-perfectable human being, and thirdly, salvation by works. And that stands in radical contrast to the Calvinist Reformation that hills to a sovereign God, human beings were incapable of being released from their depravity uh, without divine mercy through the work of Christ, and therefore salvation by grace alone. And he, he favors the, 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 the former, finite God, etc. And he says many younger Mormons today are sounding more Reformation, they're sounding more Calvinist. When I read that book before we started our dialogue, I, I said to myself, if there's any chance that they would move in that more Calvinist direction, uh, I, would, I would love to be a part of that, that discussion. And the fact is, and Bob, Bob will tell you that that's a, a false choice in, in certain ways. Yeah. But, and, and, you know, but what the community of Christ did, and, and I would say that the dominant theology of the community of Christ and the reorganized Church of the Latter-day Saints as they have evolved, is more in the direction of process theology. Mm -hmm. And that is a God who's constantly moving in a, in a direction of more and more, very similar to the limited theism that emerged for a while in the evangelical community. God doesn't know everything and restricted in his knowledge of the future. And uh, uh, so when we were in Nauvoo, uh, and Nauvoo is in many ways a sad situation because some of the buildings are owned by the Community of Christ and some are owned by LDS. And so we went over to the, to the Community of Christ side of things. You can, I, I forget exactly what I said, but you've quoted me <laughs> when we were talking to those. Uh, well, uh, what we, <laughs> we, we asked uh, Alma Blair, who was one of the now retired, but one of the former apostles of the church and a scholar of, of the community of Christ to come and speak with us. I think he brought a little pamphlet he gave to us and, and then spoke to us for a while. And, and I think Rich said something like, you know, uh, I mean no offense, but uh, 
this really sounds flaky. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, and you know, what, how did he respond? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, sound, he responded in kind of a flaky way. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, was, it was trying, it was, yeah, and that's why I said there's a movement. We share a historical figure, Joseph Smith. Yeah. Theologically, not a great deal. No. So in the, in the community Christ, they, they have adopted a doctrine of the Trinity. And secondly, they no longer require any kind of sense of the historicity of the Book of Mormon. It's one of the stories that has shaped their community's life, right? Some would call it uh, doctrinal fiction. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, but instead they've kind of moved in the direction of, I think, liberal Methodism. Uh, and from my Calvinist point of view, uh, I, I find the, the dialogue with the LDS folks to be wrestling with issues that I think the community of Christ gave up on in, in the wrong way. Yeah. You know? Well, oh, yeah. you know, there's a fascinating new book by John Turner, uh, who's a Presbyterian, got his PhD at Notre Dame under George Marsden, uh, but a, a new biography of uh, Brigham Young. And uh, going through, especially the uh, Kirtland uh, period, uh, there was a lot of speaking in tongues. Uh, it was, it, it really reads for a while, like uh, an early outburst of, of, uh, of, of Pentecostal. It was, it was a pre-Pentecostal Pentecostal. Well. That's yeah. what I was thinking. It sounded like Pentecostal it's, it's, from 70 years it's, earlier. It's the yeah. 70 years before Pentecostal. Can, can that help in terms of the dialogue with some commonality? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, Again, this is my, my thing, but I, I think Bob pretty much uh, agrees with the analysis that the idea of a continuing revelation or the adding of new required beliefs in, in Catholicism, we also have, many, many of us have the same argument with Catholics, but the highest office of Catholicism is the magisterium, is the teaching office. So that when Catholics advocate a new doctrine like the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Uh, they, 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 they emphasize the organic unity of that with the past. And so the image in Catholicism of the development of dogma is that these new teachings are to the New Testament uh, as a, a flower is to seed, in that it's a flowering. And so uh, the, the Immaculate Conception of Mary is a further unpacking of the idea that's implicit in the virgin birth. Whereas for Mormonism, uh, to put it crudely, on Wednesday, polygamy is a good thing. On Thursday, it's a bad thing. On Wednesday, blacks are not admitted to the, free, black males are not admitted to the priesthood. On Thursday, they are. And the difference is somebody got a revelation. But there was no effort to demonstrate organic continuity between the old and the new. Uh, it's a, a, a series of discrete, disconnected uh, revelations. Uh, what, what, we've, what we're seeing today is the exercise of the prophetic office more like the magisterium than, than like those old times. And so uh, any, the, today, and Bob, Bob will confirm this, that any new prophetic uh, revelation will, will inevitably be accompanied by a demonstration of continu organic continuity with the past and will have been subject to the discernment of a community of apostles rather than a single individual. Or say that another way, uh, I'd say in the last hundred years, there's been much less emphasis upon the prophet declaring doctrine, though he, I suppose he certainly could, much more tendency to have things come to the church under the signature of 15 men, yeah. the first presidency, the 12 apostles. Yeah. And, and then the connection with Pentecostalism, which also elevates the office of prophet, but it's not the re, uh, not the restoration of the office, but a, a continuation and a further intensification of the New Testament office. But in Pentecostalism, uh, at its best, uh, and we're seeing a lot of it at its best, uh, prophetic utterances need to be tested by the gift of discernment, the communal gift of discernment. And so you're not going to get a lot of uh, new stuff 
that it, it, it has to be, it, it, it can add things, but it has to be consistent with Scripture, with the, with the teachings of, of the Old and New Testament. And I think in Mormonism, also, there's going to be more of an understanding of that kind of prophetic deliverance that uh, it can't contradict, uh, it may look to us like it contradicts, but it can't contradict earlier uh, revelation. So Bob will say to you, and I, I, I find this very encouraging, that uh, we have, may have new writings since the New Testament, but they can't conflict with the New Testament. And uh, uh, so that's why they could look at John Stott and say, oh, that's great. You know? Well, because he was, the book was basically Christianity as defined by the New Testament. Right. That, in other words, there's no mention in there of post-New Testament church councils or creeds. Yeah. It's the New Testament Christianity. And I don't like this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, well, we only have about a half an hour left, so if you have questions, maybe...